All right, I'm going to be mindful of everyone's time and we are going to begin. Good evening and welcome everyone to this webinar event, Consumer Complaints, Where to Go and What to Do. My name is Jolivet Mitchell and I am the chair of the Consumer Affairs Committee and I am so excited to present this event to you, um, especially during uh, the pandemic. There have been a lot of fraudulent things happening. Um, there have been a lot of consumer complaints due to products and services. And it's hard at times for um, consumers, you know, our regular everyday New Yorkers or citizens anywhere to get the information that they need in order to resolve their issues. So uh, this panel came about based on that idea of providing resources for all of us as to where to go and what to do if we have a problem, whether it's a product or financial services. Um, it's just going to give you an opportunity to find a, a, a path to get the help that you need. And this is just a small group of the consumer agencies that are out there. There are many, many more uh, agencies that are out there that can help uh, consumers. And at the end of this event, for all of those of you who have joined us tonight, you will be receiving a follow up email with a Word document with a host of other agencies and resources that you can go to if you need help at any point in time uh, for any services that you have received or products that you've purchased. Excuse me. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce this lovely panel that we have tonight. And I'm going to begin with the New York State Department of Financial Services, my alma mater. And we have here tonight, Laura Dillon, who is the Director of Consumer Assistance at the New York State Department of Financial Services. And in that role, she has the responsibility for complaints against regulated entities, as well as the external appeal and independent dispute processes. And following her, we have Laura Levine. Laura Levine, uh, comes to us from the New York State Office of the Attorney General, and she has been the Deputy Bureau Chief of the Consumer Frauds and Protection Bureau uh, since 2012. She helps oversee a wide range of investigations and enforcement actions relating to consumer issues, including predatory lending, credit and financial services, false advertising, retail sales, healthcare, housing, telecommunications and telemarketing. Laura first joined the Attorney General's office as an Assistant Attorney General in 2008. Prior to that, she worked with the Pace Women's Justice Center. She previously worked in the private practice for Simpson, Thatcher and Barlett and served as a law clerk to the Honorable William C. Connor of the United States District Court for the Southern District of New York. Laura is magna cum laude from the Harvard Law School and summa cum laude from the University of Pennsylvania. Next, we have Claire Rosenwig. Uh, she is the president and CEO of the Better Business Bureau, serving the Metropolitan New York and the Education and Research Foundation of the Better Business Bureau for the Metropolitan Area, um, New York. She is the, the Better Business Bureau is uh, a, a leading consumer um, assistance bureau. I, can, I can't say enough about it. And um, she started with an early career in the International Tourism Regional Foundation, which led to the Vermont Hospitality and Travel Association, where she focused on marketing and communications. From Vermont, she went to the New York State Hospitality and Tourism Association. Prior to being the executive executive director and chief operating officer of the Institute of Management Consultants. Next, she was the president of the Promotion Marketing Association, now the Brand Activation Association, until 2007, when her current role with the Better Business Bureau serving the metropolitan New York area and its affiliated BBB, Better Business Bureau, New York Foundation began. Claire serves as an adjunct member of the Consumer Affairs Committee of the New York City Bar, is a mentor for the executives on campus mentoring program at Baruch College at the City University of New York, and has represented the Better Business Bureau on the New York City Mayor's Nonprofit Resiliency Committee. She served on the 2011 New York State Attorney General's Leadership Committee for Nonprofit Revitalization, is a member, board member, and past chair of the Board of Directors for the New York Society of Association Executives, and is the 2008 recipient of their Outstanding Association Executive Award. 
And finally, we have Jim Savage, who is a senior counsel for enforcement policy and strategy in the Office of Enforcement at the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. In that role, he assists the CFPB with strategic planning and advises case teams on investigations and enforcement actions concerning mortgage servicing, debt collection, debt relief, and emerging technology. Thank you to all the panelists. Um, and if anyone has questions while the panelists are speaking, we're going to reserve those toward the end. And you can simply put them in the Q&A box um, that you should see on your screen. So without further ado, we are going to begin with Laura Dillon from the New York State Department of Financial Services. Good evening. I want to uh, first thank all of you for inviting me to this event. I like to educate everybody in New York on our services. We, uh, we're sometimes hard to find and people don't always logically look for us when they have problems. So let me share my screen with my presentation. Okay, so again, we're the Department of Financial Services and we were created in 2011 when the former governor Cuomo merged the New York banking and the New York insurance departments. The role of DFS, you know, very high level is to oversee the financial services industry in New York. And, and we do that in a couple of different ways. You know, generally overarching, we look to ensure the financial solvency of our regulated entities and their compliance with the consumer protections and the mandates that are in the law. You know, bottom line, we are here to, to protect the consumers of New York State. There are certain things um, that we can't help with because we are an administrative agency. So our authority is definitely limited to the laws, the banking laws, the insurance law, and the financial services law. There are some larger groups of things that we're not able to help with. This is in by no means an exhaustive list, but federally chartered banks. We will try to help with that. We will reach out to the chases. Um, sometimes they respond to us and sometimes they don't. But while we're trying to assist the consumer, we will also refer them to the federal agency that has oversight of that entity. Also some self-funded health plans, those fall under federal jurisdiction. Uh, we know for a fact that New York health plans, if they're administering a self-funded plan, they will not respond to us. So we will immediately refer that consumer to the appropriate agency. Here's an example of some of the regulated entities that DFS has authority over. These are just general. There's a full list on our website and I've got the, um, the website down at the bottom of this list. These would be New York regulated banks. If they're federally chartered, we don't have jurisdiction. Debt collectors, insurance companies. Again, they have to be licensed to do business in New York. And if they're licensed to do business in New York, the actual policy that is the subject of the complaint has to be a New York regulated policy. There are many companies that do business nationally. And if the policy is issued in California or even New Jersey, then, it's, then New York does not have authority over that. Trust companies, cash checkers, check cashers, sorry. You can read the list. Um, as far as licensed producers, this would be agents, brokers, adjusters, bail bondsmen, anyone that we actually issue an individual or even a corporate license to do those types of work. Also on our website, there is a list of regulated entities where you can search by the name of the entity. So if you want to know, is Laura Dillon licensed to sell insurance, then you can go online, you can search by my name. You can also search by the actual type of license and get a list of all the regulated entities in New York. So here's some examples of some common complaint issues. Uh, again, not an exhaustive list. On the banking side, deposit accounts, you might have been charged a fee that you think was inappropriately appropriate or your account was closed 
without your knowledge or you can't close the account or you closed it and you can't get the funds back, anything regarding a regulated bank in New York, we can help with. Credit cards. There's actually, I don't think any credit card that is actually issued according to New York law. Most of the credit cards that are used, most if not all in New York are actually issued in another state. Virtual currency. This is a new emerging uh, area of financial regulation. New York was one of the first states to actually enter into this area. There's been a lot of scams lately that we're hearing about where virtual currency is involved. One thing to keep in mind, if it sounds too good to be true, it is. If somebody reaches out to you uh, without any action on your part and suggests that you invest in this virtual currency, be careful. I definitely be wary of that. On the insurance side, life insurance, property casualty, health, here's a list of common issues that we do help out with. One thing to keep in mind is if there's a question of fact as far as perhaps what the amount of a liability is, like maybe you had a fire in your home and you disagree with the amount that the adjuster feels they should be reimbursing. Questions of fact like that, we cannot decide. We do not have the authority in the law and the reg, nor do we have the expertise to do that. But we will direct you to the proper area if you have any questions or any concerns with that. On the mortgage side, in addition to you know, complaints and inquiries regarding assistance involving mortgage bankers, mortgage brokers, mortgage loan servicers, and mortgage loan originators, uh, we also have uh, some authority over vacant property. So if there's um, a vacant property in your neighborhood that is not being kept up, you can file that complaint with us and we will get in touch with the bank who holds that loan. So, um, you know, complaints can be filed online. That's the easiest way to do it. We've got an online complaint form, very consumer friendly, very easy to navigate. It will ask you questions. And as you answer those questions, it will just lead to the next appropriate question. If you file online, you get an immediate acknowledgement along with your assigned file number. Keep hold of that number. You can use that to submit additional documents into your file, which you can upload while you're either filing the complaint or later, you can go back and upload additional documents. If you wanna contact us about the status of your complaint, that number is also useful. You can also mail them to the address here. Once we get them and process them, obviously it's gonna take a little bit longer to set that complaint up, but we will mail you or email you if you give us your email. Uh, an acknowledgement letter along with your file number. We do accept complaints from representatives of the policyholder as long as that policyholder has um, given permission for that person to file on their behalf. One thing to keep in mind too is we get a large volume of complaints. Last year alone, we closed over 35,000 complaints, 10,000 external appeals. We had tens of thousands of emails, phone calls. So there could be a little bit of a delay for a final resolution, but we do have the ability and a process to prioritize time sensitive issues. For instance, if your policy is being canceled or you are being denied treatment for a life-saving um, surgery or medication, we will absolutely prioritize your complaint. It's very important when you file your complaint that you want to document the issue. Not only do we need a summary, we don't want a book, you don't have to write a dissertation. We need a summary of the issue, but it's very important to also include copies of correspondence. It might be a denial letter, it might be your explanation of benefits, it might be your bank statement, whatever it is that will support your complaint. If you have made any phone calls, then just a summary. Make sure that you document the date, who you spoke to, when you called, just a, a brief description of that conversation. 
you might be surprised how many people don't have this information when we ask them for it. Because we're administrative, we can't, you know, weigh testimony, so to speak. A lot of times the complaint, you know, who wins comes down to who can document their position. And then systemic or global issues that we find as a result of our complaint, we remediate them. So if we find that an insurance company is improperly canceling policies, uh, they're not providing the required notice, we will ask how many policies got improperly canceled. We will make sure that they reinstate those policies. And then we refer that matter to the supervisory unit within DFS. They have the ability to go out, examine that company, find out, you know, were they truthful? Did they actually reinstate all the policies, get to the bottom of what caused that problem? And they also have the ability to impose financial penalties. We also provide other assistance in addition to complaints. If you've just got general questions about the services that DFS provides, the, end, the industries that we regulate, a specific entity, you can call our toll-free number that is right here. You can email our consumer's email box. We also take phone calls and emails about external appeals, questions about surprise medical bills and the IDR process. We've got other emails and phone numbers. And then finally, our website has a lot of general information and the website is here. So thank you very much again for having me here. Thank you so much, Laura. Now I'm going to pass it over to Laura Levine from the New York State Attorney General's Office. Hi, thanks for having me. I'm very happy to be here um, discussing consumer complaints. I'll talk mainly about how to file an effective complaint with our office and then how we use the complaints both to aid individual consumers and to use the complaints to support our larger law enforcement efforts. Um, part of the role of the Consumer Frauds Bureau is to um, provide consumer information and education. So tonight's panel really fits within our mission. So thank you for having me. Um, let me see if I can successfully share my screen. Okay, I believe I've done that correctly. We'll find out soon enough. So I'm gonna start with sort of the nuts and bolts, how to submit a consumer complaint. You can file your complaint completely online at our website, ag.ny.gov. Right on the home screen, you will see a button that says file a complaint. You can click on that, click on consumer issues. Then you're gonna get a drop down menu. It's, we're in the process of revamping it. it um, may seem a little more confusing than it should be, but we will make sure complaints end up in the right place. Most consumer complaints are gonna fall within the general bucket of consumer frauds and scams. And if you choose that, you'll get to our complaint form, which is pretty self-explanatory. There are also some specialized complaint forms. Um, for example, we now have a specialized form for price gouging. Um, due to the pandemic, we got an overwhelming number of complaints alleging price gouging from gloves, sanitation products, basic food supplies, most recently uh, complaints about at-home testing. So we created a specialized form because there's certain information that we need about current dates and previous dates and current prices and previous prices that weren't captured by our general form. We also have a specialized form for lemon law for used and new vehicles, and that is a completely different process. There's a form that people can fill out where they can request arbitration. There's an arbitration process and we have a specialized unit within our bureau that will review the request for arbitration form, see whether it meets the parameters for lemon law arbitration. If, if it does and it's accepted, then that complaint will be arbitrated by the New York Dispute Resolution Association. I should also mention that our bureau, the Consumer Frauds Bureau, is not the only bureau that handles consumer complaints. The office has many bureaus that will handle complaints. For example, we have a healthcare bureau and they will handle complaints. For example, if you have an issue with your health insurance company and their complaint process is very robust. 
We have an internet bureau. If you have a complaint about data privacy on the internet, a data breach, they will handle issues unique to the internet. And as I said, if you don't worry too much about the form, we always will make sure it gets to the right place. And we also recognize that not everybody has the ability to file online, either they don't have comfort with, with online technology, or perhaps they don't have reliable internet access. So you can always call our office at the number below and we will mail you a paper form. So how to file an effective complaint. Um, I'm gonna repeat some of the things that Laura just said um, because I think they'll apply across the board. Um, for our form first, fill out as many of the complaint fields as possible. You know, Take the time, look at each one, give us the information. If it's on the form, we're asking for a reason. And also give us a description of the issue and focus on the relevant facts. Um, it's very understandable that people who have, you know, been fighting with a business about something you know, of importance to them, want to write down every single detail, but try to focus on the most relevant facts only. And you have the ability to attach your relevant documents when you file online. And that would be things such as your contracts, if you have a copy of advertising that you relied on when you purchased the product or service, that's very helpful to us. Um, but if for some reason your complaint is missing data that we need, we will reach out to you to get it. So what type of complaints does our office receive? Uh, the short answer is we receive complaints about everything. If it's something, you know, any product, any service, our jurisdiction is very broad. What's on the screen is the top five complaints that we received in 2021. Um, every year during National Consumer Protection Week, we will publish a list of our top 10. This is the top five from 2021. And normally these lists don't change around very much. Last year due to the pandemic, or well, I guess in 2020 due to the pandemic, retail sales was very high and that was largely due to the, the influx of price gouging complaints that we received. So some other information about filing complaints. We do allow anonymous complaints to be filed, but there's some drawbacks to that. So you should think carefully whether that's the option you wanna take. The first drawback, is obvious if you're a consumer and you're looking for some kind of relief, you want a refund, you want an extension of a service because you didn't get what you were promised. We're not gonna be able to do that for you if you don't give us your information. Uh, the second is if you're somebody, perhaps a whistleblower and there's forms for that too, if we have follow-up questions or information that would be important to us that you have and we don't have your contact information, we may be stymied in what, what next steps we can take. Uh, I also want to mention, you know, I will see sometimes on social media, media, Attorney General James, why aren't you looking at this? You know, we may come across that, but the most effective way to reach us if you want help is to file a complaint on our complaint form. So what happens after a complaint is filed? Um, we have a specialized section that's devoted to consumer complaints. You'll receive an acknowledgement of receipt. And then we'll make a decision as to what should happen with your complaint. We offer a mediation process. Um, it's not a traditional mediation process. It's more an exchange with the business or entity that is complained about where we ask, we forward your complaint. We ask for their side of the story and we ask them to make a refund or provide other relief as is appropriate. And we'll give them seven days to respond Often that will not happen. If it's a true scam, we may get no response and we will engage in some follow-up efforts to see if we can get an answer. There are cases where a complaint is better handled by another agency and then we will refer to that agency, but we will also let the consumer know. So for example, in New York City, if you file a complaint against your home contractor, in most cases, we are gonna send that to the Department of Consumer and Worker Protection they license home contractors and they have the best tools to handle those types of situations. Our complaint process is very effective. Um, here's some stats, I won't read them all, but we receive you know, thousands of complaints and our mediation process works in many cases. In the last two years, 
Um, we've recovered over $7 million in each of those years just through our voluntary process. If the issue isn't resolved voluntarily, at that point, our individual process is complete. Unfortunately, we cannot represent individual consumers. We will let them know that we were not able to resolve their issue. But even when we can't resolve an individual consumer's issue, the complaints are still very useful to our office because they may lead to larger law enforcement efforts. So I'll just talk a little bit about how we determine whether a further investigation is warranted. I hope I said this up front, but if I didn't, consumers really are essential partners in identifying fraud and illegal conduct to our office. We review the complaints, we code them by issue. So if we need to go back for any reason, we can identify trends in complaints scope, how many people are complaining about a certain issue. The attorneys will take turns reviewing the mail to identify problematic entities and practices. And as I'll discuss in a minute, we do get a lot of our cases just from reviewing the mail. And so some of the factors we consider in determining whether to investigate, um, some of these are rather obvious, but I'll, I'll touch on them briefly the number of complaints. If, if we're receiving a vast number of complaints about a certain company or individual, it may bear a second look, a closer look, and it may lead to law enforcement efforts. Identity of issues. Is everybody complaining about the same thing? The amount of money at stake. We really focus on financial issues, You know, things that really hit consumers in their pockets. If it's something that involves, for example, mortgages, or cars or other big ticket items that may be the type of thing that we want to investigate. We'll also look at where's the company based. The company does not have to base, be based in New York for us to engage in law enforcement. If the company's outside of New York, most typically we can only, and selling in New York, most typically we can only get relief for New York consumers. But if the company is based in New York, we have jurisdiction to get recovery nationwide. And so that can be very, very effective. And then finally, sometimes does the complaint involve an issue or industry we're already investigating? We've had times, for example, we were looking into auto dealers and auto dealers adding on a service or product that the consumer had no idea that they had bought. We had identified a particular product. And then we were able to go back to our complaints and say, let's take a look to see what what consumers are complaining about which dealers. And that led to additional dealers that we would look at and that we ultimately settled with. So I'll talk very quickly about some recent cases that came right from consumer complaints. And these are all cases that we've done in the last two years. Um, not surprisingly, price gouging is, is, well, I guess two of them, we filed two price gouging lawsuits recently, one was against a Weissel distributor and one once against an egg distributor. So interesting, the complaints that came in from consumers didn't name the distributors. They talked about, you know, where, whatever retail location they bought their Weissel or their eggs. And then through our investigation, after speaking with the retailers and the retailers explaining that they were just passing on price increases coming higher up the distribution chain, we were able to identify the distributors as the issue. We brought two lawsuits. And in the egg case, we settled that one um, for 100,000 dozen eggs, which we distributed to food pantries. This is the kind of case where normally we want to give restitution directly to affected consumers. But in terms of consumers buying eggs at the grocery store, it would have been way too difficult to figure out who should be getting those eggs. And this seemed like a good way to, to settle the problem, especially during, due to the economic hardship, so many people suffered. Their food pantries seemed like the way to go. So the next case is prestigious marketing. This was a largely internet-based company that was promising very hard to find gaming consoles right before the holidays in 2020. And consumers spent a lot of money purchasing these items for family members and friends to be delivered by the holiday. And in most cases, not only did they not show up by holiday time, they didn't show up at all. So we brought a lawsuit and we recently won a judgment ordering full refunds to all affected consumers. 
and barring the company and its owner from doing any business in New York until they post a bond, which has yet to be posted. So they're barred right now from working in, and selling in New York City. And the last one I'll touch on, which really goes to how important the consumer complaints are to us, is New York Sports Club. This was a very motivated group of consumers. We received, I believe, thousands of complaints from New York Sports Club members who, due to the executive stay-at-home order early in the pandemic, who could not use their health clubs, tried to get refunds or tried to get cancel their membership, and New York Sports Club was not allowing it. And based on the number of complaints that we received, it was very obvious that we had to take action. And we sued New York Sports Club, and we ultimately recovered $250,000 to distribute to, me to members who were affected by these, the inability to cancel. And that restitution amount, that should be distributed very shortly. So the last thing I'll just mention briefly um, is what is involved with an attorney general investigation. Our statutes, we have very, very broad authority. We can basically cover fraudulent, deceptive, and illegal conduct. And the illegal conduct can cover everything from a local law to a state law to federal law, unless it's something where we're preempted. So we really can do almost any kind of consumer case. And we have subpoena authority. So if we want testimony or documents, that's a tool available to us. And the consumer complaints play a valuable role in putting together our investigations and any litigation that we may need. We will often reach out to the consumers who complain to our office, get their story, obtain an affidavit from them that we can use in court, that consumer stories in their own words are really compelling evidence and very helpful to our cases. And typically we will resolve our case through a settlement, which is called an assurance of discontinuance, or we'll continue all the way through litigation and get a court judgment. And in, the, in our cases, we will typically seek permanent injunctive relief, which is something like, you will not run this type of advertising. You will not you know, lie to consumers about what your services are. We will seek restitution for affected consumers. And we will often seek civil penalties as well for the law violations. So that, that's what I have to say about consumer complaints. Thank you very much. And we can turn it over to the next speaker. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Laura. And now I'm going to pass it to the Better Business Bureau. Claire, you're up. Hello. All right. I'm going to, uh, hi, everybody. <laughs> I'm also going to try and see if I can do this uh, sharing of the screen. So give me one second. Uh, let's see, share screen. Share. So that should be, you should be able to see that now. All right. Well, thanks, everybody. Thank you so much for inviting the Better Business Bureau to be part of this important program. We're, we're delighted to be part of it. Um, we're the only one, I think, on the panel that is not government. Uh, we're not enforcement. But what we are is a place where nationwide, uh, close to a million people file complaints. And over 8.2 million people have looked at our BBB business reports and charity reports just here in the Metro New York area and probably 200 million, I think, nationwide, but I'll get into those later. Um, but what I wanna do today is just share just a few things about the BBB and then talk about where to go and what to do. Uh, because as we said, some people come to the Better Business Bureau because we're not government. You know, we just, we attract a lot of people uh, complaining to us. Um, and what we try to do first is help businesses be better. And we try to help consumers have tools at their disposal so they don't get into situations where they need our consumer dispute resolution services. So we do a lot up front to educate consumers, to educate businesses. We also work with charities and to try to have the marketplace be somewhere where everybody can trust each other. That's really the mission of the BBB. So speaking of that, you know, the vision is to have an ethical marketplace where buyers and sellers can trust each other 
And the mission of the BBB is to be a leader in advancing marketplace trust. And there are over 100 Better Business Bureaus all over North America. And together, we work at helping consumers find the resolutions and the information they need. Uh, I'll show you the Better Business Bureau's website in a few minutes, but I'll just kind of knock through all of this. We are a standards-based organization that was formed originally in 1912. And uh, the first BBB out in the Midwest uh, then started moving all over uh, the country. And we were formed, we were formed to focus on regional and national advertising. The whole idea is to investigate misrepresentations, eliminate abuses, basically to have truth in advertising. Uh, the goals remain the same as they were then. Now, we wanna make sure that advertising, if you're gonna say it, make sure you can do it. And we want to celebrate those that do, and we want to call out those that don't. Uh, as I said, we celebrated the uh, centennial of the BBB system back in, uh, um, it was formed in 1912, so in 2012. And we've been recognized throughout history by a number of presidents. Uh, we rung, rang the bell <laughs> at the New York Stock Exchange uh, in 2012. And the New York Stock Exchange actually formed this BBB here in Metro New York. But the BBB today, we are nonprofit, we're non-governmental. Uh, we focus on helping consumers find businesses and charities that they can trust. We are a 501c6 organization. We are members along with 100 other BBBs of the International Association of Better Business Bureaus. They have the copyright and trademark uh, to the BBB brand. There's other members of the family besides the 100 Better Business Bureaus. There's also an Institute of Marketplace Trust, which is a C3. There's the Wise Giving Alliance, which is the charity arm of the Better Business Bureau system, and they license the accredited charity seal. And there's also BBB national programs, which I imagine some of our lawyer friends on the call today are familiar with, which I'll go into in a few minutes. In 2021, as I was saying today, people turn to the BBB more than 200 million times for business profiles on the 6.3 million plus businesses that are at bbb.org. We also have about 12,000 charity reports and they're all available, no charge at bbb.org. It's an easy thing for people to remember. Just here in the Metro New York area and our BBB of Metro New York covers everything south of Albany, all of Long Island and of course the five boroughs. There's another BBB up in the Buffalo, in the Buffalo area that covers the upper tier of New York. And just our BBB in Metro New York, uh, consumers have looked at our business reports, our charity reports over 8.2 million times in 2021. Just Metro New York, we, take in, uh, we took in about 86,000 complaints from business, about businesses from consumers which was a 7.2% increase from the year before. And they have also filed over 76,000 consumer reviews. Uh, these are, you know, you can, you can file a complaint, but you can also file a, a, a consumer review on a business. And that was a, a huge increase over the year before, 48% increase. The BBB in Metro New York, as I started to say before, we are celebrating our centennial, uh, 100 years as of June 6th. And we were formed by the New York Stock Exchange. And it was we were formed about truth in advertising. And at that time, there was a lot going on with investor scams. And uh, interestingly enough, we're still dealing with similar things. Uh, as I mentioned, we're a C6, we are governed by a board, and we do have three offices, although we are still working remotely for the most part. One in New York, one on Long Island, and one in Mid-Hudson. The core programs of BBB, you know, everybody knows BBB for our complaints, but we do more than that, right? We have the business and charity reviews, which is where we really try to point people so they can see what we say about a business before they do business with them. 
Uh, yes, we do dispute resolution. I'll touch on that in a few minutes. There's advertising review services. Every day we are looking at advertising. When a business wants to become an accredited business, checking their website, checking their ads, is there truth in advertising? And we have a code of advertising very similar uh, to the FTC's code of advertising. The advertising review services goes on daily. We have a lot of consumer education through webinars all the time. We either do them on our own or we collaborate with the other BBBs. We collaborate with the FTC. Uh, tomorrow, we're doing a program on cybersecurity with CISA and the FBI. So we work a lot with other agencies to collaborate to get this information out into the hands of consumers. There's also scam alerts and promoting business self-regulation. We have a new feature on the website called the BBB Trust Hub for Businesses, because one of the things we want to do is help businesses be better. Our standards are pretty basic. I mean, it's start with trust, advertise honestly, tell the truth, be transparent, honor promises, be responsive. And this is very much in the area of complaints. Safeguard privacy, stand for integrity, and abide by BBB codes. And if a business wants to be accredited, they must meet these standards. They're vetted before they become accredited, and they're vetted every year before we send them an invoice for renewal. In 2020, the I'm sorry, in 2021, the top 10 complaint categories, as you can see here, financial services, telecommunications and you can read them for yourself, online retailer. These are like financial services and insurance, you know, like we were saying earlier, um, I think Laura was, both Laura's actually were saying, uh, credit cards, fees, mortgage issues, anything that's marketplace based, we handle at the Better Business Bureau. What we don't handle, as you saw uh, with my um, fellow speakers, we do not handle landlord or employment complaints. We don't handle um, competency, let's say, of a doctor or uh, an accountant. We will handle the business side of those complaints. But what happens if, if we, when we do see a spike in complaints is that's when we work with our um, colleagues on the enforcement side so we can get something done, even if BBB can't do it. We also have scams that we report on. And here you can see the top scams in 2021, online purchase, employment scams, sweepstakes scams, phishing scams. Again, no surprises here. What we do is when we get a complaint and anybody can go to bbb.org, I'll show the form in a few minutes. It's an easy online application, but as Laura was saying earlier, not everybody has uh, access to online. So yes, we also take paper complaints. And I can speak personally, going into that office twice a week, we scan those complaints, every single one, even if it's on a yellow piece of paper or an index card, we will send it to our uh, complaint department. And the way that works is anybody anywhere can file a complaint at bbb.org. If that company is headquartered in one of the BBBs, like if it's a company headquartered in New York, BBB of Metro New York handles that complaint. If we happen to get a complaint that should be in California, we'll send it there. So anybody anywhere can file a complaint at bbb.org and it will get funneled to the proper Better Business Bureau to handle. What we do is when we get a complaint, we send it to the business uh, within two days. We have to open those complaints within two days as BBBs. A lot of that is done obviously electronically. But if we get those complaints by mail, we have to open them promptly as well. That complaint goes to the business and the business is informed that they have a complaint uh, from a consumer. They have two weeks to contact us. If they don't, there's an automatic email that goes out to them again saying, hey, you know, we haven't heard from you. If it's an accredited business, they get a different letter, similar letter, but different saying, hey, you know, you said you were going to be responsive. If you don't respond, you're putting your accreditation in jeopardy. And what we try to do is close the complaint within 30 days, generally. Um, a complaint can be answered. A complaint can be unanswered. 
a complaint can be unresolved or a complaint can be answered um, with in good faith, I guess you would call it. So if you are an accredited business, you can't have an unresolved and you cannot have an unanswered complaint. You must answer those complaints and you must make a good faith effort to answer those complaints. We have about a 75% resolution rate. And people can go to bbb.org, look at a business report on that company and see, read all about it. They can see the complaints, not every single one. If it's a high volume, we publish every few. And then, you know, there's like every 20, if they're very high volume, or you can see the complaints if they are publishable. Um, if it goes beyond that first step, we will handle mediation and we do have arbitration when necessary. We also try to inform the public through media. Um, as you can see here, some of the areas, it's a lot of me, sorry about that, but um, COVID tests in January, uh, a lot of COVID testing pieces that we did. And just the other day, I did one on cryptocurrency scams. There was a, you know, cryptocurrency is just being used as the currency with a lot of scams that we're all familiar with, like romance scams in that particular case, where they were trying to get people to, quote, invest in cryptocurrency on exchanges, of course, that don't even exist. The national programs, um, these are programs that some of you have heard of on a national scale, the National Advertising Division, the EU Privacy Shield, sorry, we're not going in order. AutoLine is um, a Better Business Bureau system agreement with the major auto dealers. And it's a lemon law, if it, it goes, it's just before the lemon law. If you don't wanna go to the AG yet, you try the um, AutoLine program. And many times we can work that out so it doesn't have to go to, to the AG's office. Uh, EU Privacy Shield, National Advertising Division, CARU, uh, Children's Food and Beverage, and uh, Direct Selling, uh, National Advertising Review Board, all of these are part of this BBB National Programs Organization now, which is a 501c6. We do have alliances with many of you on the phone here today, the Federal Trade Commission, the Attorney General's District Attorney, um, Postal Inspection, Department of Consumer Affairs, the IRS, then there, the US Postal Inspection, well, I said the Postal Inspector. Um, be, for the very reason we just said, when we get complaints, many times we'll see a spike in those complaints and we work with our law enforcement partners uh, they send us subpoenas for our information. There's a, a real give and take between the organizations because ultimately, what do we want? We want resolution for the consumer. And even before that, we want to make sure consumers are uh, given enough tools so they can protect themselves. As I mentioned earlier, BBB, which a lot of people don't realize, we also handle um, reviews on charities. This goes back to the 30s, to the 1930s when businesses would come to us and say, what do you know about this charity? They want money from us. And now, of course, with all of the um, social issues that are going on, the war in Ukraine, a lot of people want to give. They want to do something to help. And unfortunately, as, as sometimes happens, scammers will take advantage of that. Same with crowdfunding. There's, there's just an awful lot to be aware of. So a charity, if it wants to go through our process, there is no charge. And what we look at in the, in the 20 standards of charity accountability are governance, finances, marketing and fundraising materials, and organizational effectiveness. And if a charity meets all those standards, they're automatically noted at bbb.org or give.org as an accredited charity. If they wish to use this seal in their marketing materials, there is uh, a modest um, uh, licensing fee, which is optional. So resources, I'm gonna just click on this for a minute because I just wanna show you the BBB's website. See, hopefully this works. We'll see if it goes through, there it goes. Well, there it is. So any consumer, anyone can always go to bbb.org. It is um, geo, located so you can go to the national or you can go if you were in Chicago it would show you the Chicago but this is the website taking a look at what's there businesses can find out all about getting accredited they can file a complaint if you click on that here's the form 
and people, it leads them through the process, asking them the questions that we need. Claire? Yes. Uh, I think you need to switch screens. Oh, to switch screens. Let's see, how does that work? Um, you know what? Let me just go back because I don't know how to do that. Let me go back here. I'm gonna stop sharing for a second because I don't know what I just did. <laughs> But you know what, the, uh, let me just say it this way. Um, if you go to bbb.org, you're gonna see just a real easy way to file a complaint. You're gonna see a real easy way to look up any company, over 6.2 million companies all over the country. Uh, and you can call us. I mean, we get like 500 phone calls a week. Uh, and again, if it's something about Metro New York, that's great. If it's not, we'll point you to the right direction um that's pretty much it i i supplied a resource page which uh joe Yvette, i think you said you're going to send out and that's going to have all the information uh that i was going to show you on that screen but i do encourage you to take a look at bbb.org uh, to see what's there uh, there's an awful lot of information for businesses for charities and for consumers and with that um i will stop my video and hand it back over to you, uh, Joel Beth. Awesome, thank you so much for that. We can try during the q and I can uh, pull it up, but next, and our final speaker, I see the Q&A, we, we're getting a lot of questions, it's coming in hot, but don't worry, just one more speaker and we have plenty of time uh, for your questions. Next up is James Savage from the CFPB and I am going to Pull up your presentation. And whenever you are ready. All right. Thank you, Joe Levet. Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm Jim Savage, and I'm with the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. As uh, you may know, the CFPB is the federal agency responsible for enforcing all, let me try and change my speaker here. I'm getting some bad feedback. So. All right. Okay, I, uh, I'm gonna try it again. Um, the uh, CFPB is the federal agency responsible for enforcing all federal consumer protection rules and laws covering uh, consumer financial protection, uh, consumer financial products and services. Uh, these include things like student loans, credit cards, mortgages, uh, credit reporting and debt collection to uh, name just a few of the markets that we cover. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, just give me one second. Sure. Sorry, just some technical difficulties. I'm gonna go out and start again. All right. Terrific, thank you. Now, one of the primary functions of the CFPB is collecting, investigating, and responding to consumer complaints. Now we accept complaints uh, online, over the phone, and by mail. 
And last year, the Bureau um, sent more than 750,000 complaints uh, to companies for review and uh, response. Uh, next slide, please. Now, we really do encourage uh, consumers to submit complaints through our website. And uh, the complaint site can be found at uh, www.consumerfinance.gov backslash complaints. Now, um, and this is actually the most popular way for consumers to reach us. And about 95% of the complaints we received last year were submitted online. But as I said, uh, still, uh, we can use uh, the phones and the mail as well. Um, one of the benefits of the online uh, complaint form is that it really helps ensure uh, completeness of information and it uh, enables us to send uh, the complaint uh, to companies very quickly. Uh, typically, we can forward these complaints in a day or less. Um, the online form also allows uh, consumers to attach uh, supporting documentation, which will help companies uh, assess the issues that are raised and, and respond accordingly. Uh, next slide, please. So there are um, uh, five steps to our uh, consumer complaint form online. Uh, the consumers first uh, select the financial product or service uh, with which they're having a problem. And as you can see from the slide, uh, those categories are, uh, are pre-populated. Uh, once the uh, consumer has selected the financial product or service, uh, they'll identify the issue that best describes the problem they've experienced. Again, this comes from a pre-populated uh, list of issues um, that will allow us to kind of route and describe uh, the complaint correctly. Um, once that issue is selected, uh, the complaint form prompts consumers to describe what happened and what kind of resolution they're looking for. And at that point, consumers are invited to um, attach any uh, relevant documentation. And um, also at that point, consumers will be prompted to uh, uh, decide whether or not they would consent to allow their narrative to be uh, published in our uh, public facing uh, consumer complaint database. Um, after that, uh, consumers are asked to identify uh, uh, the company that they want to uh, have us direct their complaint. And finally, uh, there's a prompt for the consumer to submit the uh, complaint with all their information. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, once a complaint is uh, submitted, it goes through uh, several steps to um, help uh, the consumer get their problem uh, resolved. Um, as I mentioned, the consumer uh, the complaint is submitted. It's then routed uh, directly uh, to the company so that the kind of company can uh, review it and uh, respond to the issues. In some cases, uh, we may find that uh, the complaint is best handled by a, another agency, in which case we will direct the complaint to the proper regulator, say, uh, we don't have jurisdiction over um, banks with the assets less than $10 billion. So the complaint would be forwarded to their prudential regulator. Similarly, if uh, the complaint doesn't uh, concern a product that we regulate, perhaps the FCC is the best uh, regulator to address the problem, we'll forward the complaint to the FCC. Um, the next step, is that the, uh, 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 the uh, company will use the portal to respond to the consumer's issue. Uh, companies generally respond uh, in 15 days. 
Uh, in some cases, uh, it might take longer, in which case the uh, company will let the consumer know that it will take a little bit more time, and, uh, but the company is obligated to respond within 60 days. After that, um, we will publish uh, information about the complaint, of course, without the consumer's uh, personal information uh, to our uh, public uh, consumer database, uh, provided that the consumer has consented to uh, that publication. Um, and uh, then we will let uh, the consumer know when the company responds. Um, again, uh, and, and then uh, once the, the company does respond, uh, the consumer has another 60 days to provide feedback on uh, the company's response. Now, as, as you can see from this process, our, our complaint portal is really meant as a way for consumers to escalate their complaints directly to um, companies. And because companies know that the CFPB is watching, they're incentivized to respond uh, appropriately. Uh, we do not represent individual consumers. Uh, we do not act upon individual complaints. However, um, these complaints are regularly uh, analyzed and reported on by our consumer response unit. And uh, that information is particularly helpful to uh, my colleagues in the Office of Enforcement and in the Office of Supervision insofar as it allows us to identify spikes and trends in complaints and prioritize our enforcement and uh, supervision tools uh, uh, appropriately. Uh, next slide, please. Um, now, just uh, some uh, information on our public facing consumer complaint database. Again, this is a great uh, resource for folks to get more information about uh, financial institutions and uh, some of uh, the issues that uh, consumers have been having in the marketplace uh, with banks, with debt collectors, with credit agencies and the like. Um, only complaints sent to companies for response are eligible to be published in this, um, in this database. And they're only published after either the company responds or after 15 days from uh, when the consumer makes a complaint, which, uh, whichever comes first. Uh, we do not publish complaints uh, referred to other regulators. And uh, we'll also uh, publish the uh, consumer's narrative uh, if the consumer opts to allow that information to be uh, made public. Again, we were very careful uh, to remove any personal information that might be uh, included in that narrative and in the complaint. Uh, next slide, please. Now, if um, you or your clients have any questions about uh, filing the complaint or the complaint uh, process. Uh, you can call uh, the CFPB at 855-411-2372. Uh, um, uh, TTY, TDD service is also available at 855-729-2372. Uh, and um, the uh, complaint uh, service is uh, available to serve consumers in uh, more than 180 languages. So we try to make it as accessible as possible. Uh, we are open from 8 to 8 uh, Eastern time, Monday through Friday, except federal holidays. So that's uh, all for the uh, CFPB process. Thank you. Thank you, James. A uh, round of applause or virtual applause for all of our panelists. And now we are going to jump right into the Q&A. And while the question is being answered, I'm actually going to try and pull up the BBB website and share so Claire can walk us through, which uh, she wanted us to see earlier. So to our first question, and I guess this applies to all panelists, 
Um, the the speaker is specifically asking about DFS, the New York Attorney General, but I guess everyone can answer. Does DFS or the New York Attorney General take some action on every complaint? I'll start since I went first. Um, we do. We investigate every single complaint that we get. Uh, we will take action if we find that our regulated entity did something wrong. We will always resolve the individual complaint. And again, if we find a larger global issue, then we will have all those other um, claims or whatever the case may be corrected also. And, and my answer is similar. We will review the complaint. If it's appropriate for our mediation process, we will, we will send it to the complaint about entity or individual. Um, and we will also see whether this is something that should be subject of a larger law enforcement action. But, you know, there are times where we can't get a satisfa satisfactory resolution from the company or the individual, and it may not rise to the level of something that should be a larger investigation. So in those cases, you know, our work may be done. Okay. Any of the other panelists want to add to that? Uh, as to the CFPB, the primary action is um, forwarding the complaint onto the company and having the company respond. We, we don't take uh, specific enforcement action. We don't mediate complaints, um, but uh, that information does help uh, inform our enforcement choices. Okay. The next question is for, oh, again, New York State Attorney General. Um, someone wants to, is having trouble with a landlord and so that they have filed endless complaints with the New York State Department of Buildings, which have been ignored. Is that something that your office handles? Fraudulent oh. uh, filing certificates? Potentially, we do have a, a special bureau now that deals with landlord tenant issues, um, but I'm sure there's not every landlord tenant issue that they deal with. I, I would recommend filing a complaint. If it's not something they can deal with, they will let you know, um, but it may be something that they can deal with. Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> the Attorney General's uh, popular tonight. Can small businesses file a complaint against other businesses with the New York Attorney General? That's a really good question. Um, you know, historically, we really brought cases mainly on behalf of consumers, but, you know, a lot of small businesses in many ways are similar to consumers. They may not have lawyers when they're engaging in a transaction. They may not be sophisticated in this specific area. So we have brought law enforcement actions on behalf of small businesses. Um, Claire's probably familiar with it. We brought a big case against a company called Northern Leasing on behalf of small businesses nationwide, and we got a very good result. So um, we may not be able to handle every case on behalf of small businesses, but we've, we've done more and more recently. We actually have a current lawsuit right now on behalf of small businesses who um, engaged in something called a merchant cash advance transaction um, to get money, um, and we're alleging that those are illegal loans. So excellent question. That is an area that we have become more involved with recently as we see how small business are getting, businesses are getting scammed in the same way that consumers are, you know, in their personal and household uses. And <clears throat> excuse me, Joel, that, and I would also add that for the BBB, we would also take a complaint if it was a marketplace. So for instance, um, you ordered business cards or you ordered a website to be developed and the company did not come through. Uh, you could file a complaint with the BBB and we would follow through on it. Uh, to, but you have to have some resolution, a marketplace resolution requested in mind. You have to know what you want and then it has to be marketplace oriented. Thank you. Next, ah, our very own Tom Kahn from the Consumer Affairs Committee is also sharing with us that Complaints can also go to the FTC, the Federal Trade Commission, where you can click on report fraud or report to the FTC to start their complaint. Maybe at the, the next time we do this, we'll invite them. Uh, okay, we have 
someone who needs help with a self-storage company. And has other issues. So I'm guessing with a business, they can go to you, Claire, or to Laura with that issue, correct? If they're if they have a complaint against uh, it's a storage company, Manhattan Mini Storage. Yeah, that's so that's something that we would hear about in terms of if they have many issues, if it involves a multiple you know, multiple companies, then each company should, they should file a separate complaint, not, not put it all together. But self-storage is an area that we have, you know, authority to look into. Okay. Perfect. Moving along. I was just going to add that Better Business Bureau would take a complaint about that. The one thing I would say, though, is if somebody has already taken something to court, we wouldn't take it at that point. It has to be pre- legal <laughs> so well that's that's good to know to exhaust all the administrative options mm -hmm. yes ah would there be a way to get slides from the lecture i think that we are not allowed to share the slides but if you did register for the event tonight we have a separate document that will be sent to you and it will have all of these resources um, the links to the websites and the complaint pages. And as Claire mentioned, the Better Business Bureau has also provided a special part of the document that will have their um, reporting um, structure provided as well. Is that correct, Claire? So you Sorry, will get... I keep unmuting and muting myself. So yes, it's correct. <laughs> so you will be getting that right after the event. So look out for that email. Okay, should a consumer complain to multiple, can, can a consumer complain to multiple entities or is redundancy discouraged? For example, a COVID testing site for price, for price gouging to the New York State Attorney General's and the Better Business Bureau. I have no objection to consumers, you know, advocating for themselves in as many forums as they can. Um, you know, it, it's always possible that for some reason, you know, for resource constraints that we can't take a look at something, but perhaps the FTC or DFS can. So I don't think there's any problem with that. I mean, we'll often, if it's a, something we're interested in, I'll go to the FTC database or the CFP database to see, you know, what other complaints are out there. So I don't think there should be any any hesitation to follow in more than one place. Yeah, and, and I would agree with that, that, you know, take the COVID testing as a good example. I know the attorney general sent out a number of warning letters to certain companies. We, on the other hand, were getting complaints from consumers. And it was almost like a reinforcement where we could say, you know, the attorney general has sent out letters to these companies. And if you take a look at their um, BBB business profile, you'll also see that there are X number of complaints. And by the way, if we see a spike in complaints about a company like that, we often, communicate with our enforcement partners uh, so they could take the action that Laura was talking about. Good, all right, moving right along. Are complaints about goods and services such as bad hair, color, cut considered? If you file a complaint about something like that, that you paid for you know, a service that was not as, rep as it was represented perhaps, then that is something that we would mediate um, if it was sent to us. Right, and if it was sent to us, what we would say is, what do you want? You know, are you looking for a refund? Are you looking for uh, another? I, I, I can't imagine you'd wanna go back to the same place if it was a bad cut, but what do you want? You know, what is the resolution you want? But we would accept the complaint and, and see what it is that we could do. All right, here's another one. Where does one file a complaint against a person representing himself as an architect, even though that person does not have a license? Ooh. So we not have sure. I'm not sure I even understand the question. Could you repeat that again, please? Where does one file a complaint against a person representing himself as an architect, even though that person does not have a license? So it looks like fraudulent um, representation 
If that complaint came to us about lack of license, I'm not sure who licensed architects, but whatever body licensed them, I would suspect that we would forward the complaint to them as the more appropriate body to handle it. But if it comes to us, we do make sure it ends up at the right place. And Department of State does most of those licenses. licenses. I don't know if they do architects. Right. They do do people who do hair, though. So for the first they one, they do. So I'm thinking it's them. <laughs> DOS, yeah. <laughs> DOS is on the list. So again, look out for the email with resources. This question is for the Better Business Bureau. Must the object of a complaint for the BBB be an accredited entity? You're on mute, Claire. Sorry. Um, Better Business Bureau handles complaints about any business. They do not have to be an accredited business. In fact, accredited businesses are treated the same way that any business is treated. They have to answer their complaints. And frankly, if they don't answer their complaints, they will not be an accredited business for very long uh, because being responsive is one of the standards. So any business, uh, or I should put it another way, anybody can complain about a business anywhere in the United States. And we will be sure that the appropriate Better Business Bureau gets that complaint. And accreditation has zero to do with our handling of complaints. Thank you. The next one is warranties regarding Home Depot abdicating from their 25 year roof warranty guarantee. I'm just going to read the whole question now. Home Depot has unilaterally abdicated from its 25 year roof warranty guarantee is now offering an adjuster's review leading to a claim amount if I find a contract, if I find a contractor. That might be DOS. Or... That it, it potentially could be us as well. I, I would say probably as well as the BBB. We do handle people who say I have a warranty and the company refuses to honor it. Um, that is an issue that potentially we would handle. And it could be DFS also. We license what we call service contractors. So when you buy a car and you get that extended warranty, that's technically a service contract. So it could be us also. Okay. And we have a couple more left. What are the statute of limitations on when you can make your complaint? I think this is for all panelists. <laughs> so let's start with... Uh... You're, you're on mute. We we'll start it. with DFS. <laughs> so we don't have a statute of limitations for filing a complaint. What you might run into, though, is our regulated entity may no longer have the records required to respond to that complaint. So there's different record retention requirements on the banking and the insurance side. So it's anywhere from three years to six years. My suggestion is to get it in sooner rather than later. Uh, same with BBB. Um, we used to have, I think it was one year, but I think we gave that up uh, because there are warranties and such that go on for longer than that. But we would recommend sooner than later for obvious reasons, companies go out of business. Um, I can't tell you how many times people send in a complaint, either the address is returned or the company is out of business. So we want people to get their complaints to us as soon as they can after, of course, trying to work it out with the business first. And I would say the same. I mean, memories are fresher the sooner you file. Um, so there's no statute of limitations for, for if you want to complain to us. Um, under our main statute, though, in most cases, we can go back six years. Um, there may be cases we can go back more, but you know, generally, if it's something that happened more than six years ago, it, it, it's less likely that we'll be able to assist, but that doesn't mean you can't file something. Yeah, and I, I forgot to mention earlier too that complaints once filed and closed do appear at bbb.org uh, for three years and then they roll off. 
And the uh, same holds true for the CFPB. There is no time limit per se to filing a complaint. But remember, um, you know, we hope that the complaint process allows you to resolve the problem with the company. If it doesn't, uh, your ability to seek relief and our ability potentially to bring in enforcement action um, is going to be limited to the extent that uh, too much time has, has, has passed. So the sooner the better. All right, the sooner the better is the resounding theme. And our, oh, we have, okay, now this is two more questions. For the New York Attorney General, are there any updates on the, I guess there is activity against telecom or cable company providers for slower data speed than advertised? Um, I know that our Internet Bureau um, I brought a case a while back on that issue. Um, I don't think, know that we have anything public out there. Obviously, if we have any kind of investigation, that's something that we would not be able to reveal publicly. Fair enough. Uh, okay, now this looks like the final question. <laughs> Why are consumer remedies against contractors licensed or unlicensed for smaller jobs limited in New York State? Not sure if there's a definite answer for that, but if any of the panelists want to give it a go. Yeah, as I said, most in New York City, most of those we refer out, so I don't have enough information to, to expand upon that. You know, the only thing we could say really is if as a consumer or as a citizen of the city, um, if you're not satisfied with a department, you know, you, there's always legislators and regulators and you can voice your opinion as to what you think should be done. Uh, doesn't get it done right away, but it does give voice to your concern. Okay, that was the last question. Um, I am happy to share, try and share my screen and Claire, you can walk us through the Better Business Bureau website as I have it pulled up and let me see if I can get it here. All right, that's great. So, all right, so see where it says up on top, don't scroll yet, go back. Where it says find, just put in, type in something like contractor or you can see some of the home improvement, just click on any one of those. You will see what comes up. You can choose just accredited businesses or you can choose both to and click on all. Oh. And you will see now, that's all right. And you'll see, you can, I don't wanna give anybody, we're not endorsing or promoting any particular company, but once you go there, you can click on any of these. You can get a quote, you can see if they're accredited. Go back to everybody, like, yes. Yeah. So you, this is what a business report might look like. And go back up to the top and just type in uh, any one of those again. And this is what we ask company people to look at so they can see what we say about a company. Uh, if you want to unshow everybody, you know, and scroll down, you'll see all kinds of accredited and non-accredited, and you'll see that some of them are rated NR, some of them are rated A+, some of them are rated Fs, and so on. Um, so go back to the main screen again, to the home. Just click on that BBB logo if you want. You'll, there you go. Now scroll down. And you'll see, you can file a complaint right there. Click on that. And it leads you through the process if you just scroll down. And it will also tell you, going back towards the top, um, if you click on right, you know, where it says in that first little paragraph at the end, there are some disputes BB can't help you with. When you click on the word here, and it will show you what we can't help you with. Oh, that page doesn't work, sorry. I'll have to report that something happened. 
Um, but if you go back to the home page, once again, um, and you see this little hamburger menu, I call it, those three bars up in the right-hand corner, little tiny things there, I call it hamburger menu. The three, yeah, click on that. Now you'll see all these different things. If you wanna go down to Scam Tracker, it's like the one, two, three, four, fifth one down. Go back up, there you go. This is Scam Tracker, where you see all over the country, you can zoom in on New York. If you just click on one of those bars in our area and just clicking to make it big, big, big. Just takes a little while, I guess, in this. A lot of complaints in New York. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, you could put in, let's say in keyword, you could put in, or scam type, you can put in cyber or something like that to, to uh, or just click on any one of those circles. And now go down, scroll down a little bit and you'll see them listed, I think, at the bottom. Yeah. And you can see the different types of scams people are reporting. If there's any money that's been lost, you can read about it. And again, these are so important because it gives people, sometimes you'll read, I read about this and I didn't fall for it. So that's scam tracker. Um, anyway, that, that's, I think that's enough, um, Jolivet. But I think the key is for people to go to bbb.org and see what's there um, because consumers really, I can't tell you how many times people say, I wish I had looked at that before I went to that store or before I went to that contractor. But thank you very much. I appreciate you doing that. I learned something about Zoom today. <laughs> Technology. <laughs> yes. Thank you. I... Oh, we got a couple more questions. Any way to get a recording of tonight? Yes, there will be a recording available. Um, through the Bar Association. So be on the lookout for that. And that is it, it looks like. Um, again, thank you to all of our fabulous panelists for taking time out of your busy schedules um, to come and talk to folks about consumer complaints. This was so enlightening. Um, and thank you to everyone who took the time out of their day as well um, to, to learn something. And hopefully this helps you going forward. So everyone have a wonderful evening. And if we do this again, hopefully we'll be seeing you again soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having us.